I thought I would persecute the saints down here rather than up there. I hope you don't mind. I'm a little closer to you, and uh, the light isn't going to shine so brightly on my forehead that it blinds the folks in the front rows here. I want to pre- uh, express my appreciation to Pastor Steve and the music ministry this, uh, this Lord's Day. It's been such a blessing to me and my wife. Uh, she mentioned how much she enjoyed the ladies' ensemble this morning. What a special treat that was. And uh, it's a joy to sing the hymns of the faith. I did want to ask Steve, I probably should ask this in private, uh, that last hymn we sang, was that a different, was there, are, is there more than one tune to that one? I was trying to fit it into the one I remembered, and it just didn't fit. So. We live it up in love, so we it up. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, I want to follow up on something that Jimmy Sue said this evening. Uh, Looking forward to seeing loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. The Bible has a lot to say about what we refer to as the blessed hope. And one of the central features of the blessed hope is what the scriptures say about the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. It's a topic I've actually presented here, but it's been five or six years ago, and I hope uh, it will be an encouragement to all of us this evening. The judgment seat of Christ, you have the handout in front of you. My distinct impression, my distinct impression is that the members of Berea Baptist Church are eager to serve the Lord. I, I, I'd be surprised if there's a single member in this body who isn't involved in some way in serving the Lord. Now, in some positions, everyone observes if you are serving the Lord. You're Ted and you're teaching. Everyone observes that. But I would say perhaps the majority of believers in this church and elsewhere in their serving the Lord may go unnoticed by others. They may be faithfully serving the Lord, sacrificing of themselves, without a single other person seeing it. And what I want to remind us of this evening is that although all of us are engaged in serving our risen Savior, not many of us perhaps are in positions where others see our service. But you know the Lord observes every labor done on his his behalf. Every, Every single opportunity we have to witness every time we give of ourselves in the cause of Christ, every time we shoulder a burden and help out here at Maria Baptist Church. Others may not see it, but the Lord sees it. And he has promised to give a reward for all of our labors at the Bema Seat of Christ. We want to look at that this evening. Uh, You have my handout. I'm going to go through it and draw your attention to some highlights here. Does everyone have a handout? Let me ask that. Does everyone have a handout? Does anyone not have a handout? Good, okay, let's begin then. Uh, On two occasions, the expression, the judgment seat of Christ, or the judgment seat of God, is found describing Christians following the rapture, standing before Christ, and being held accountable for their lives. Our Lord has reminded us in the Gospels that we will give an account of every word we speak, much less than everything we do. We will give an account. A number of questions are raised with these and related verses which describe the judgment of believers as followers of Christ. What is this judgment? And how does it harmonize with other texts which teach that believers will never face God's condemnation and judgment? How do we understand that the relationship between what the scriptures tell us about the judgment seat of Christ and the passages in scripture that tell us that you and I will never, ever face condemnation or judgment? Never. So how do we harmonize that? Well, that's what we want to do this evening, try to harmonize those texts. So let me give a definition of the judgment seat of Christ. The name judgment seat comes from a word referring to a seat on a raised step or platform located in a public area within a city. 
the civil magistrates would sit on such a seat when performing their judicial duties. Now, drawing that down to the New Testament. Most of the New Testament references to this seat occur where an individual is brought before a ruling authority for the, for, for judging of, for the judging of some charge. Pilate, for example, sat on a bema or judgment seat when he tried our Lord and Savior. That gives you a little bit of context. Now, there are two views that are popular and uh, what will take place at the judgment seat of Christ. I just mentioned the two popular views. They aren't the only ones, but they are the popular ones. Let's take a look, just briefly. Some view the judgment seat of Christ as a place of intense sorrow and shame, a place of terror. The believer's sins are revealed publicly, and the believer is punished for those sins not confessed or not properly dealt with in this life. I've heard it described in messages where there's a giant screen uh, uh, where your life is portrayed in all of its uh, humanity, <laughs> and every, every sin is exposed publicly to all of the uh, redeemed at the judgment seat of God. And, and that, if that were the case, if, if that takes place, uh, this, this understanding of the judgment seat would probably have more truth than, than error. The second uh, popular approach is to take the opposite position, viewing this as a place of no remorse or shame, but only of rejoicing. Christ strictly dispenses rewards, and every believer receives at least some recognition for service. Now, if these were the only two options, I know which one I'm going to choose. I suspect I know which one you're going to choose. But really what do we want to look at tonight is what does the Word of God teach us about the judgment seat of Christ? And how does that, how does that presentation on the judgment seat of Christ fit in with what we refer to as the blessed hope? The blessed hope of our Lord's return for us. We want to show how those are fully reconciled. It is a blessed hope. We have three key texts and... Uh, I'll just uh, draw your attention to some of the sections in these texts. Romans 14, I, I mentioned that Paul addresses matters of conscience in Romans 14 and the problem between a weak and a strong believer. Paul is addressing that issue when he writes these words. So now I have a citation from the text. And Paul writes, But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again... Why do you regard your brother with contempt? They were, the weak were judging the strong and the strong were judging the weak about matters of conscience. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, Paul writes. And then drop down to verse 12, if you can see it, it's small print. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. We will all stand and each one will give an account. The second passage 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this is where Paul describes his ministry at Corinth and the ministry of those who follow him. Paul writes, According to the grace of God which is given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And then the third and final passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, here Paul discusses his motivation for service. Paul writes, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, 
I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be in the, at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done. Notice, please, whether good or bad. Well, let's begin by addressing some questions about the judgment seat of Christ. And you've got the questions here. First of all, who is going to be judged at the judgment seat? Now, according to the the above, this judgment is specifically for Christians. That is, for believers as members of the body of Christ. Uh, Writing to the church at Corinth, Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When Paul says all... He's referring to himself and to his readers, that is, to believers as members of Christ's body, the church. Everyone here who has put his or her faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and Jesus alone for for salvation is a member of Christ's body. We have been baptized by the Spirit, placed into the body of Christ, and Paul is describing our judgment when he's describing the judgment that's in view here. I say here, Other judgments are mentioned in God's word, but Christians are not involved in these. One of the most popular judgments associated with Christians, but really not with Christians, is found in uh, our Lord's uh, discussion in Matthew 25 about the judgment of the sheep and the goats, or the sheep and goat nations. That is often described as a judgment where believers are involved, but that's not the case. That is not the case. That judgment takes place at the end of the tribulation. You and I are raptured to the third heavens with our Lord at the beginning or before the tribulation. We're actually in heaven. You might recall John 14. I go to prepare a place for you, our Lord says, that you might be with me the Lord's talking about rapturing the church and being with him in the third heavens. So the judgment seat of Christ does not take place at the end of the tribulation. Matthew 25 judgment takes place at the end of the tribulation. We have our Lord sitting on his throne at the end of the tribulation, judging the sheep and goat nations. And what our Lord unfolds in that judgment is the sheep are, are believers the goats are unbelievers, and collectively there are all those who have survived the tribulation judgments on the earth, have survived the battle of Armageddon, and now they are being judged by our Lord. We are not going to face that judgment. That is not a judgment you and I will experience. The other judgment, perhaps even more familiar, is the judgment at Revelation chapter 20. It's called the Great White Throne. And you and I are not going to stand at the Great White Throne before Almighty God. That is primarily focused on the judgment of unbelievers who are then tossed into the, thrown into the lake of fire, which John describes as the second death, what we commonly refer to as hell. So we are going to have an accounting of our works, but those judgments that are popularly uh, are familiar in Scripture are not judgments that you and I will experience. When does this judgment take place? Well, we've already looked at that, at least initially. Let's take a look at this. This judgment takes place in connection with the Lord's return. In 1 Corinthians 3.13, Paul links this judgment with the coming of the day. The day. And the expression the day is an abbreviation of the longer expression, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an expression we find in both Old Testament and New Testament. The day of the Lord is how it's couched in the Old Testament. The day of the Lord Jesus is how it's couched in the New Testament. Specifically, I say, the judgment seat of Christ as part of this day, the day of the Lord, follows the rapture of the church. It occurs while believers are in heaven with Christ, again, John 14, and before Christ returns to the earth at the end of the seven-year tribulation to establish his kingdom. So that's when it takes place. Once we are raptured, right before the tribulation judgments begin to unfold. We are taken to the third heavens and we will stand before our Lord 
and give an account of ourselves. That's the judgment seat of Christ. What is judge? That's probably uh, the key thought here. Let's, 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 let's take a look at this question, or the answer to this question. What is judge? The judgment involves an evaluation of the believer's works. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul states that it is our works that are to be examined, and in particular, our works performed as Christ's servants. Anything you and I do in the cause of Christ as servants of the Lord, that's what's going to be evaluated. Furthermore, I say these works are judged by Christ to determine whether they are good or evil, that is, whether they are those that Christ can approve. Remember that passage, 1 Corinthians 3, he can approve those works that are described as gold, silver, precious stones, or he is not going to approve those works that were described as wood, hay, and straw, is he? You remember that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So you might ask me right now, well, wait a minute. So you and I are going to stand before our Lord. We're going to give an account of ourselves, that is, our works. Our works are that which, are, which God is going to, or, or Christ is going to evaluate. And those that are good works, they're going to be accepted by our Lord, and we are going to receive a reward. Those that are not good works are going to be rejected by our Lord, and we will not receive a reward for those. So your question to me right now is, what is a good work? How, how do I know what a good work is? I want, I want to, if there's a ledger, I want the good works on this side stacked high. I, I'd rather have not anything on this side, the other side of the ledger, or at least just a few of if at all possible. So what is a good work? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question. Because <laughs> here's my answer. A good work is anything that you and I do as believers in obedience to God's word, motivated by faith and love toward God. Now, I'm going to say that definition again, then I'm going to illustrate it. A good work is anything that you and I do as believers, only a believer can do a good work, a good work is anything you and I do in obedience to God's word and motivated by faith and love toward God. Now, my illustration of this is uh, the uh, discussion by James of Abraham. James dis uh, holds up Abraham as an example of one who engaged in a good work when he offered his son Isaac. He's holding up Abraham, and then later he holds up Rahab, of all people, as those who engaged in good works and uh, demonstrated the reality of their faith. So we want to look at this thing that Abraham did in Genesis 22. And why is that a good work? So I'm, I'm going to set it up by kind of asking you some rhetorical questions. I mean, you can answer, but I'm not really looking for an answer. I'm just going to pose it in the form of a question. If someone were to ask you, why would Abraham offer his son, or at least try to offer his son, as a sacrifice, how would you respond? If someone were to ask you that question this evening, why would Abraham do it? And you would respond to them, well, because God told him to do it. God commanded him to do it in Genesis 22. All right, remember our definition? A good work is anything you and I do in obedience to God's word. Why was Abraham trying to offer his son Isaac? Because God had commanded him to do it, and Abraham was responding in obedience to the word of God. All right, that's only part of the definition. It's an important part. If I were to ask you, you know, did Abraham love Isaac? <laughs> you would say, well, of course he loved Isaac. That was the son of, his, uh, of, of the promise. That was the son that he had with uh, Sarah. That, that was the son he had been looking forward to all, ever since the Lord gave him the promise. Abraham loved Isaac as a parent, as a parent loves a child, his, his or her child. So the question is, well then, Abraham, why on earth would you try to offer Isaac on an altar of sacrifice if you love Isaac? And if I were to ask you that question, well, why did Abraham do that? If he loved Isaac, why did he do that? You know what your answer would be to me? Abraham loved God even more. That's the only answer. That is the only answer. Abraham loved God even more. He loved Isaac. He loved Isaac as a 
Father loves the Son, but he loved God even more. And God even mentions that in Genesis 22, now I know that you love me. You have not withheld your only son from me. My last question. Was Isaac the son in whom and through whom, through Isaac's offspring, all the promises that God gave to Abraham would find their fulfillment? I'll say that again. Isaac is the son through whom, that is through the offspring of Isaac, all of God's promises to Abraham would be fulfilled. All of them. So the question is, Abraham, let's think about this for a moment. Do you really want to offer Isaac on the altar? You are offering the son through whom all of God's promises are going to be fulfilled. Think about that for a moment, Abraham. Now again, if I ask you the question, well, why did Abraham try to offer Isaac the son of promise, through whom all of the promises that God had promised to Abraham were going to be fulfilled, why would Abraham do that? You know what the author, author of Hebrews tells us? In chapter 11, the author of Hebrews tells us Abraham was fully convinced that if he were to sacrifice Isaac, God would raise him from the dead. The author of Hebrews tells us that. Abraham was fully confident in God's promises such that if he had slain Isaac as God had commanded him, the author of Hebrews tells us that he was absolutely convinced without a shadow of a doubt that God would raise Isaac from the dead, and necessarily so because it was through Isaac and Isaac's offspring that all those promises that God gave to Abraham would find their fulfillment. All right, there's our, there's our definition. A good work is anything you and I do in obedience to God's word, motivated out of faith and love for God. That's a good work. That's a good work. All right? And that's what's going to be evaluated. It's our work. Perhaps a, even a greater question, why does God judge Christians? After all, we are his children. He has saved us from our sins. Why is he judging Christians? I say here, the purpose of this judgment is to issue rewards for service. It's our works that are judged and the purpose is to issue rewards for service. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.14, if anyone's work endures, he will or she will receive a reward. I say here, as such, the judgment seat of Christ does not directly address the believer's sins. Though it is understood that sin is the reason why a specific work would, not, would be counted worthless. And this next point if you, if you don't remember anything else, would you please remember this next point? Please remember this next point. Neither does this judgment place in jeopardy the salvation of the believer. Do I need to read that again? <laughs> it is a, in, in the very next verse, Paul states that if the believer's works are shown to be worthless, he himself will still be saved. Quote, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. It is his works that are burned, I say, and the loss that he suffers must refer to the loss of reward that would otherwise have been his. He is said to be saved yet so as by fire, meaning his ultimate salvation, his final salvation, is accompanied by the loss of reward. It is our works that are judged. And the purpose of God's judging those works is to issue reward. And I want to pause there for just a moment. You would agree with me that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We have not earned we have not merited, we do not deserve the least of God's gifts, much less the greatest, his only begotten son. We don't deserve, we have not earned, we do not merit. We are saved because of God's grace. And I read Paul's words about God giving us rewards for service. 
And I'm, I'm familiar with what Paul says in Philippians. For it is God who is at work in you. It is God who is at work in you. And it's God who will complete that work. So why am I getting any reward? It's all of God. Why am I getting a reward? It is all of God. God is pleased to pour out grace upon grace. He has graciously saved us, sinners as we are, and he's going to give grace upon grace and actually give us rewards for serving him through the power he has given us to do that. <clears throat> well, there's some un answered questions we want to grapple with. The first is, what about unconfessed sins in this life? I say it cannot be stressed too strongly that believers' sins, past, present, and future, have once for all been forgiven at the moment of salvation, and believers will never face eternal condemnation. Our sins, the scriptures teach us, that at the moment we repent and believe in Jesus, the Lord, as our Savior, the very moment our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, in totality, once for all, as far as the east is from the west. I go on, though. Unconfessed sin does affect the believer, <clears throat> but it is the believer's relationship with God in this life. In this life, such unconfessed sins hinders the believer's effectiveness for the Lord's service. I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that here this evening. Our sin hinders our effectiveness. It tarnishes our testimony. It takes away our appetite for the things of the Lord. <clears throat> and unconfessed sin brings divine chastisement that imp impacts the believer's joy. The author of Hebrews tells us that in uh, chapter 12. In order to restore unhindered relationship with God, believers must sincerely confess their sins to God. Included in this confession is the acknowledging of sin, the exercising of repentance, and the seeking of divine forgiveness. Now, in the next, the next thought, we're going to look at 1 John 1, 9, so I'm going to come back to the point I've just made here. What is, what is confession? What is confession that we are called upon to do as believers in this life? God has promised to cleanse and forgive the believer who sincerely confesses sin, thereby, thereby removing any obstacle to effective service and blessing. John, when he writes 1 John 1, 9, it's prob <coughs> probably a verse that most, if not all of us, have memorized. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're all familiar with that passage. You know, John anticipates in the way he wrote that verse that that's something you and I do on a daily basis. Do you know that? John expects us, as we are reading that verse, that that is something you and I do on a daily basis. And, and why is that? <laughs> well, forgive me if I'm painting you like I'm painting myself, but I sin every day. I'm a frail vessel. I'll be the first to admit it. My heart and mind are prone to wander. I can be an easy target for temptation. I can. And in all of these things, I, I sin. Every single day, I sin. And therefore, every single day, I need to confess my sins. That's what John is telling us. In fact, John is saying it's the one who can, if you remember that passage, John is saying it's the one who confesses his or her sins that demonstrate that they have been born of God. The one who denies that they have sinned or the one who denies that they have a sin problem, John says, are making God a liar. It's the one who confesses sins, John says, gives demonstration of, of obedience and uh, of, uh, of regeneration. I jokingly tell my students, 
I jokingly, but it's, it's more, <laughs> it's not a joke, but I jokingly tell my students, if there is a verse I'm going to wear out in Scripture, it's 1 John 1, 9. But John actually thinks, indicates that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's something you and I need to do on a daily basis. Confess our sins. Repent. Acknowledge we are guilty and ask God for forgiveness. And, and John says he is faithful and just to do that. Such sins, I go on, committed by a believer should never be taken lightly. Why is that? Well, because they are those for which Christ died. And if unconfessed, they subject the believer to divine chast chastisement in this life. Nevertheless, again, if there's a second thing you remember, please remember this. The believer will never face eternal condemnation and punishment. Never, ever. Let me see if I can illustrate this, because there's a tension here, isn't there? Our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. We still sin. And we're called upon to confess sin. So how, how do we reconcile that? Well, you, you recall, the night our Lord was betrayed, uh, during the uh, Last Supper, he takes a basin of water, he takes a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Do you all remember that, 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 uh, that uh, accounting in the Gospels? And he comes to Peter, and Peter says, wait a minute, Lord, wait a minute. I should be doing this for you. This is the role of a servant, Lord. I need to do this for you. And the Lord looks Peter right in the eye and says, Peter, if I don't do this for you, you don't have any part with me. This is something I need to do for all those who are mine. And then Peter responds, we love Peter, don't we? <laughs> Peter responds and says, well then, Peter, uh, Lord, I want the whole bath. <laughs> Not just the feet, Lord, I want the whole body wash. And the Lord says to him, and here's where the connection between our sins having been forgiven once for all and our need to confess sins in this life, our Lord says, you know, Peter, you have already been cleansed. You have already been cleansed. But I must do this because as my servant, walking on this sin-cursed earth, you're going to kick up the dust of sin, and it'll get on your, on your feet. Symbolizing, of course, it's all symbolizing that the Lord continues to cleanse his servants who have been forgiven once for all, past, present, and future. Let me put it this way. When, when, when you, uh, if, you have, if you have children, um, let's say I, my two sons, when my sons were younger and they would do something that would upset me, they would, they would disobey me or disobey their mother, you would agree with me that they would become at that moment my disobedient children, right? But they wouldn't stop being my child, would they? They wouldn't stop being my son or if I had a daughter, my daughter. So, the, the, the scriptures teach both truths. Our sins have been once for all forgiven in salvation, past, present, and future. And we have become the children of God, and God is our Father. But as His children, we continue to sin in this life. And for that reason, we need to confess those sins and seek God's cleansing and forgiveness that he has promised to give. I hope that helps. Uh, one more thought here, then we'll uh, try to wrap it up. Uh, let's jump to uh, page five. And we'll pick it up with a question, what about hidden sins? What about hidden sins? I say, is the judgment seat of Christ an occasion where hidden sins are revealed, those that we have not dealt with properly, and where believers face shame? And my understanding from the passage that we looked at is a qualified yes, a qualified yes. What do I mean by that? Well, according to 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul states, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, and then each one's praise 
will come from God. Since it's praise will come from God, I'm assuming he's describing believers here. Parallel to this is Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done. Please note now whether good or bad. I argued earlier for 1 Corinthians 3 that the recompense regarding that which is bad involves specifically the loss of reward. But notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. Notice these words. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, here's my understanding of 1 John, and then we'll wrap it up. I say all true believers do abide in Christ. All true believers do abide in Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, I write it out here. All true believers persevere in the faith and in faithfulness are good works. That's my understanding. Every true believer will persevere in their faith, that is, in believing the gospel. You say, well, wait a minute. I had, I had a friend who believed the gospel for years, and then when he was an adult, he said, I don't believe any of that anymore. What about him? Well, my understanding is that that person was never a true believer to begin with. Because it's my understanding from Scripture, every true believer will persevere in believing the gospel. And I understand from James chapter 2 that every true believer will have some good works, some good works, if their faith is a genuine faith. Now, follow me here, follow me here. These works are not a condition for salvation. They are not. They are the evidence, they are the evidence that one is saved. They are the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. <clears throat> However, I say, although all do persevere, all true believers do persevere, not all do so to the same level of success. Therefore, the feeling of remorse, regret, and even shame cannot be avoided at the judgment seat of Christ as believers' works are judged and evaluated. All right, don't stop there, don't stop there. At the same time, these will not be the controlling emotions at this event or in the kingdom or in the eternal state. The overwhelming emotion throughout all of this will be those of gratitude and joy. Gratitude and joy. All right, let me conclude with this thought. I say from all of this, we can conclude that the judgment seat of Christ is a serious matter. It reminds us of the importance and necessity of faithful living as we will certainly give an account of our lives and service on that day before an omniscient and thrice holy God. At the same time, the coming of our Lord is a blessed hope. We will receive our resurrec resurrected bodies in which sin no longer dwells. I am looking forward to that day like no other. I am tired with this struggle against sin, and I long for the day when I will receive my resurrection body in which sin will no longer dwell. I long for that day. We will stand glorified before Christ without fear of condemnation or punishment. Our Lord has once for all borne the guilt of our sins and has paid forever the full penalty of God's wrath. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Above all, it will be a time of joy and rejoicing in the grace and goodness of God in saving us and giving us eternal life. The judgment seat of Christ may be compared to a commencement ceremony. At graduation, there, are some, there, there is some measure of disappointment and even remorse or perhaps sadness or sorrow that one did not do better or work harder. However, at such an event, the overwhelming emotion is still joy, not remorse. The graduates do not leave the auditorium weeping because they did not earn better grades. Rather, they leave the auditorium thankful that they have graduated and are grateful for all that has been accomplished. Let me end it this way. I've been teaching seminary since 1977. I am that old. <laughs> I have seen a lot of graduations in my day. 
I have never, ever seen a graduate walk across the platform, <coughs> receive their diploma degree, and walk off that platform with tears running down their face, filled with sadness and sorrow. Never have seen that. Never, ever. What have I seen without exception, without exception? Every single graduate walks across that platform beaming with joy and gratitude for the grace of God. And that will be our experience at the Bema Seat of Christ. You know, the Bema Seat of Christ is designed to encourage us in faithful service. We should be reminding each other of the Bema Seat, reminding ourselves. It's, it is, a, as I say in my title here, a key incentive for faithful service. There is not a single thing that you will do for our Lord, not a single thing that you will do for our Lord in humble obedience to his word, motivated out of faith and love toward God, but that God sees it. And you will receive a reward for it. I don't care if anybody else sees it or not. God sees it. And you will be rewarded at the Bema Seat of Christ. Do you have any questions? This is kind of an informal evening. Is this microphone still on? All right. Um, how do we close, Steve? Should I pray? And then dismiss? All right, let's pray. <clears throat>